If I were to describe how the average Catholic looks at the world today, I'd describe it like this. Broad and wide is the way that leads to heaven, and everybody's going that way. And narrow is the door that leads to hell, and hardly anybody's going that way. But you know what? That's just the opposite of what Jesus himself tells us the situation is. Broad and wide is the way that leads to destruction, and many are traveling that way. And narrow is the door that leads to life, and few there are who are finding it. Now, Jesus didn't say this because this is how it has to be. People who are on the Broadway don't have to stay on the Broadway, and that's where we come in. That's where our prayer, that's where our love, that's where our intercession, that's where our witness comes in. We need to really invite people to leave the path that's leading to destruction and find the person of Jesus Christ who can lead them to true life here on this earth and eternal life. Hey, welcome to another week of The Choices We Face. You know, one of the things that I'm so happy about having a weekly program is that there's always more. There's always more in relationship with the Lord. And Peter, we, we just really enjoy talking about no, that, it's don't great. we? I love it. We enjoy calling each other on to yeah. the more, don't we? Yeah. It's like we do on the show what we do naturally at other times, yeah. you know. Yeah, they could yeah. tape us just normally talking. Right. And, you know, yeah. yeah. Anyway, it's you know, I've, I've been very interested in how much is possible in relationship with God. You know, I... I, I when I was converted, when I was a senior at Notre Dame, I just knew that God was, I don't know, I, I hate to say awesome, it sounds so trivial, but God was just God, you know, yeah. absolute, like, and I just wanted to know him and follow him and um, be, be one with him. And, uh, and, and then, you know, as you go along in, in, in the Christian life, you run into snags and obstacles and you wonder, gee, I wonder how much is really possible. And then one day uh, for a, a history of spirituality class at the seminary, I had to read a, a book by John of the Cross. Now, I had tried to read him shortly after I got converted. And I picked up a book called Ascent of Mount Carmel and it scared the heck out of me. Yeah. I said, whoa. It's I don't, too much. Yeah, it's, it's too, too much. Too, too hard, it's too, too hard. Too negative, too yeah. dark, too, too extreme. Like I, I don't, so I, I just put it down. and. 20 years later, 25 years later, I had to read another book of his called Spiritual Canticle. And this time, I don't know, the Lord just decided that, okay, you're ready. You know, he, he, he turned the lights on and it just really inspired me a great deal about how much union with God is possible. So I spent about 10 years going through each of the doctors of the church in the area of spirituality, people like John of the Cross and Teresa of Avila, Catherine of Siena, Bernard of Clairvaux, uh, St. Francis of Sales and others. And as I did so, I was really struck by how much they were talking about the same process of transformation, like God had given them the same wisdom. They each brought different enrichments to it, like some were more sensitive about how this played out in relationships, some were more sensitive about how this actually played out in the innermost recesses of the soul. I thought if you could ever put all, those, all that wisdom together, you'd have an amazing and wonderful vision of, of the, the spiritual journey. So that's, that's where the book came from, The Fulfillment of All Desire. It took me 10 years, but I'm really happy it's there because it's the book I always wanted to have, you know, where the best wisdom of the Catholic Church really is, is there. And so what I learned from, from doing this is that a lot is possible and that the Lord wants a lot. And I just like to a start- A lot is possible for everybody for, is what you mean, yes, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. Yes, and listen to scripture here, Ephesians chapter one, verse four. It says, he chose us in him, Jesus, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. We were created for holiness. And, and that's really important to know that the reason why God created the human race was for us to be holy and blameless before him. Now something, happened that really messed that plan up. Yeah. The, the fall, the sin. And so where we come from today is we, we hear that God chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. We say, that is so far out of my purview. That is so not possible for me. There's a tendency to give up. Now, there's another scripture passage in Hebrews that says, strive for that holiness without which nobody can see God. Uh-oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> holiness and seeing God are connected. Yeah, yeah. Can, this isn't yeah. just a nice ideal, but this is like a necessity. Like growing in holiness is necessary if we hope to be with God forever, you know? And so it must be possible. And therefore, you know, so many times Jesus gives a teaching that seems impossible to the disciples, like one man and one woman for the rest of your life. And the disciples said, hey, it'd be better not to get married. And then Jesus says, well, with God, all th with human beings, it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible, even a lifelong relationship of faithful love and marriage. Another time he says, it's harder for a rich person to get into the kingdom of God than for a camel to get through the eye of a needle. And whether the eye of the needle is a narrow gate in Jerusalem or whatever, the disciples say, well, who can be saved? Jesus said, yep, that's, that's a very good response. Who can be saved? For human beings, it's absolutely impossible, but for God, all things are possible. So one of the things the saints do is they talk about the stages of spiritual growth. And one of the things that Pope John Paul II said, uh, he said, we really need to reconnect with this, these wisdom of the saints because, and he said this in Novo Millennio Eniente, that, that great vision statement for the church that we, we love. He says, this great mystical tradition shows us how prayer can progress as a genuine dialogue of love, even to the point of rendering the person wholly possessed by the divine beloved. I, I know that you like to talk about discipleship, but that's what discipleship is. Mm -hmm. You know, being wholly possessed by the divine beloved, being completely under the Lordship of Christ, vibrating at the Spirit's touch, really sensitive to the Holy Spirit, you know, uh, receiving his inspirations, receiving his, his corrections of being led by the Spirit. Another place the scripture says, those who are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. Mm -hmm. So this is, like, this is like foundational stuff. This is necessary stuff. This isn't just a, a nice ideal for monks. This is something right. for every single Christian. And finally, resting filially within the Father's heart. That, that intimate relationship with the Father, that, that, that knowing that we're loved, knowing what our identity is, knowing that we're sons and daughters. And so there's just a tremendous wisdom in these saints about how that can become real in our life. And I know, Pete, you've got a lot of good questions to ask yeah, me, so, no, it, so start. I think a helpful place to start would be, we're called the holiness. What is holiness? Mm -hmm. What is it? I'm really glad you asked that question. Yeah, that wasn't even a setup. Just, no, it yeah, wasn't. Yeah. I didn't know you were going to ask it. I, I, in fact, I don't know what you're going to ask, yeah. I don't think. Yeah. And so uh, that's a really good question. Was holiness sometimes has this aura of like hothouse kind of spirituality. Like, you know, you light candles in church and you say as many rosaries as you can. And I'm not against saying rosaries. I say rosaries myself. But that's not the essence of holiness. What the essence of holiness, and this is, this is kind of, new for some people to hear, is having our hearts transformed into hearts of love. Because when Jesus tried to sum up the whole purpose of all this, he said what it's all about is loving God with our whole mind, our whole soul, our whole strength, and our neighbor as ourselves. So Jesus says what this is all about is changing our fearful, our fearful hearts, our selfish hearts, our, our hate-filled hearts, our unforgiving hearts, our, our, our just our hearts that are closed in on themselves and expanding them to be one with the heart of God, which is a heart of love. Now, now Teresa of Avila gives another definition. She says, what it means to grow in holiness is to bring our will into union with God's will, to love what God loves, to hate what God hates. Now, this is radical, but God hates some things. He hates what messes up the happiness of his people. He hates sin. He hates what separates us from the purpose for which we were created. Therese of Lezu gives another definition of holiness. She says, what it means to be holy is to say yes to the person God created us to be. So sometimes people experience holiness as a burden that God is placing on yeah. them, like, darn it, I got to be holy. Yeah. Can I still go to football games? It's going to ruin my weekend. Yeah, 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 yeah. Can I still drink beer? You know, can I still have fun? Sure. You know, that type of thing. And do I have to pray all the time? You know, but holiness isn't a burden that God's trying to place on us. It's a blessing he's trying to give us. He's trying to give us a greater freedom, a greater love, a greater joy, a greater, a greater sense of who we really are. Okay, if I'm, I'm saying, okay, I hear you. And Good. I want to I do that. 
I know I'm not there. I don't even quite have the desire to do it. Yeah. Now I'm convicted. I'm supposed to do it. I yeah. can't opt out. I can't just leave it for the monks and other people. Yeah. I've got to do it. Everybody's got to do it. Otherwise, we're not going to see the face of God. Yeah. And how do I go forward? There's this, how, how do you begin? Where do yeah. you start? Yeah. Well, what the saints say in the early stages of the spiritual life, it's particularly hard because you're turning away from sin. You're turning away from bad habits. And so the first step is really to recognize that there's some things that might be in our life that are blocking the union with God that the Lord wants us to have, and that's serious sin. Now, you know, maybe 30 or 40 years ago, people had some idea what serious sin is, but, but today it's a little vague, you know, like, oh, you mean uh, not recycling or, uh, <laughs> you know, or, you know, if I don't believe in global warming, is that a sin? Or, you know, you know like, it's a little vague. And that's why it's so important to receive the word of God in scripture about what blocks our relationship with God. Like 1 Corinthians chapter six, Paul says, don't let anybody deceive you. The immoral will not enter the kingdom of God. The fornicator, the adulterer, the person who engages in homosexual activity, the thief, the robber, the miser, the idolater, the drunkard will not enter the kingdom of God. But then the good news comes, and such were some of you, but you've been set free by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, by the blood, by the water, by the spirit. And so the first thing we have to do is accept God's conviction of, of sin in our life and say, yes, I wanna, I wanna, I wanna change, I, wa I wanna turn away from these things. Now, sometimes when you hear that this is serious sin that blocks us from God, you say, yeah, I, I don't wanna do it, I'm gonna stop doing it. And some people are able to stop doing it right away. Other times we've become a slave to serious sin. You know, we've become like a habit With of sin. a bondage to it, right? A bondage yeah. of sin, like, like it was for St. Augustine. And this is really encouraging. St. Augustine became enslaved to sexual sin, and many people today are, sure. you know? And so by the time the Lord had awakened him and called him out of it, he said, you know what? I want to get out of it, but I can't. You know, I'm, I'm helpless. But he said, I'm responsible for having gotten to this point because through a whole series of decisions I've made over a number of years, it's made me a slave, but I'm a slave. I can't get free. So he just began to call out to God and God began to send people to help him in different ways. He began to read things. Things began to happen in his life, chance encounters. And one day uh, he heard this voice saying, take and read, take and read. He opened up scripture. And there's a word there for him said, make no provision for the flesh, yeah. you know, and, and, and that, that, that freedom, you know, that was the final kind of thread that had to be cut and, and that freedom. So what I would say to people who are at this early stage of the spiritual life, turning away from serious sin is whether it's a struggle or whether it can happen instantly, persevere. If you, if you want to get free, you can get free, but you gotta, you gotta do your part. You know, you've got to avoid the near occasions of sin. You've got to frequent the sacrament of reconciliation. You've got to fill your mind and heart with good things and not bad things. And, you know, like Jesus said, if your right, right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. If your right arm causes you to sin, cut it off. Hey, if your computer causes you to sin, get rid of it or, or put blocks on it. Or, you know, don't, don't stay up late at night watching stuff you shouldn't watch. I mean, like, you got to kind of do your part. Yeah. But once you do your part, you're, that's kind of disposing yourself for the grace of God to come into your life and eventually you will be set free. Oh, you're talking, it's good. That leads me to another question. Okay. You're doing your part, you said, and the yeah. other part is disposing. So there's this, you know, Jesus said, unless you abide in me, you can't bear good fruit. It's right. not possible. Yeah. You know, the flesh is useless. This is what we're stuck in. We're stuck in that self-centered thing, that habit of, of uh, pleasing ourselves mm -hmm. and uh, the habit patterns of sin are rooted in our flesh. Mm -hmm. Jesus said the flesh is useless, but only the spirit gives life. Yeah. So uh, the spiritual journey is get serious, decide and go for it. But it's not just my decision or an act of the will. And how does that really work together? Yeah. Well, let me let me say one other thing that's absolutely necessary that we do on our part that enables God's grace to really work in our life. That's to pray. I, I don't think there's any way around it, Peter, but yeah. taking some time each day for personal prayer, just being before the Lord, just kind of crying out to him, whether it's reading that little Magnificat, the Psalms there, the readings of the day, the intercessions or a prayer book, whatever can help you focus on the Lord and turn your mind and heart to him is really important. You know, you and I travel a lot and I have to say, 
I meet a lot of people, even who have experienced renewal in their life, who are sort of coasting in a certain way. They've kind of reached a certain plateau and they're trying to repeat past experiences or they're living off past experiences. You don't have the sense that they're moving forward. And one of the things I think is often the reason why that's the case is that they're not serious about taking some time each day for personal prayer. And uh, Teresa of Avila, uh, many saints say, if you don't pray, you're probably gonna be lost just because you're gonna be engulfed by the world. And so mm -hmm. taking some time each day for personal prayer is really important. As you do that, the saints talk about prayer beginning to gradually deepen, gradually broaden, going from just us trying to pay attention to God to God beginning to do things in our soul. Uh, Teresa of Avila talks about transitioning from uh, meditation to the prayer of quiet, where we just become a little quiet, we're more aware of the Lord's presence, God's presence starts to grow in our life, our, our perception of God's presence grows. And then she talks about uh, periodically experiencing something called the prayer of union, where, where our, our will is really fixed on God and, and we're just more and more deeply engaged in, in the Lord's presence. He's, he's doing things in our soul, he's, he's healing our soul through his presence, through his love. and so. That, that grows and, and God begins to do more things in our life. And the, and the, the yielding to the Holy Spirit is, is sort of key to the whole process. Yes. I mean, it's the work of God in yeah. us right. that we cooperate right. with. And how do you yield to the Holy Spirit? I mean, what does that mean exactly? Or John Paul's yeah. be docile, yield, right. surrender. Vibrate they're all exhorting the us, the yeah, they're yeah. exhorting us to do all that. How, how, do you, how do you do it and how do you know that it's happening? Yeah. You're doing it. <laughs> Well, you know, it's trial and error. You know, yeah. you say, gee, I just got this thought. I wonder if that's from the Holy Spirit or from me. Well, hey, if it's not any life-changing decision like, you know, move to Alaska, which, which you should check with other people about yeah. and submit that for discernment, but if it's like call somebody or uh, go visit somebody or read this book next for your spiritual reading, something like that, or some kind of a little sense that maybe you should go to Mass today or something like that, act on it. Give the benefit of the doubt and see what happens. See whether it's kind of leading you closer to the Lord or not. Seeing whether it's opening up a door for service or somebody saying, gee, I'm really glad you came today. I was just feeling alone and you really encouraged me or you know that type of thing. It's just sort of like, sometimes it's like imperceptible kind of almost little, little, little nudge, little nudges. So recognize that the way the Holy Spirit works is oftentimes through little nudges or little illuminations or a certain passage of scripture starts to stick out or a little urge to go to mass or a little urge to pray extra or whatever and, and acting on those little nudges. And Jesus says, he who is faithful in little things will be put over larger things. So if we're faithful to these preliminary nudges of the spirit, pretty soon our whole life will become more and more led by the spirit and, and, and lived in his presence. What would you say the role of the baptism in the Holy Spirit is in relationship to people being able to live this way more easily or more fully somehow? Yeah. And what does it have to do with, you, you uh, talked about, John Paul, talking about the mystical tradition. Yeah. That's a word that just seems so far away from people. Yeah. And I think it's, some, it's connected to the work of the Holy Spirit in us. How, how, does, how does that go together? Yeah. Well, I'd say that baptism in the Spirit, which, by which we mean something like we see happening in the Acts of the Apostles on the day of Pentecost, like a, a strong experience of the power of the Lord, the presence of the Lord, jump starts the whole process. And so some of the mystical grace that the mystics talk about can be experienced in the early stages of spiritual life, but it doesn't mean you're in the fifth or sixth mansion. Uh, you, you may have just been given the grace to get free of serious sin. You may have just been given the grace to believe wholeheartedly. You may have just been given the grace to desire to give your whole life to the Lord. But there's still the long journey of, of transformation, bringing our character, bringing our, our, all the decisions of our life, all the energies of our life, stably under the rule of Christ, but being baptized in the Holy Spirit. And, 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 and so, like retreats, um, Life in the Spirit seminars, Alpha, uh, Ignatian retreats, uh, cursios, uh, so many different things can help jumpstart this whole process and kind of plunge us into the spiritual life in, a, in an accelerated way. But all that wisdom about how every part of our life needs to come under the Lordship of Christ still needs to happen. Yeah, and the, the example you gave of Augustine, there was, you'd say that time in his backyard there where he was looking at the scripture and it just jumped out at him and it was transformational. He was weeping and he was being touched. That's a mystical grace. Is that, I mean, does that fall into that category when you say 
Is that what that is? Is that what's well, happening well, you know, or well, no? Well, you know what? I don't even like to use the word mystical yeah. because it sounds kind of esoteric and you think yeah. about... That's actually why I'm asking it because yeah. the, the quote from John Paul talks about yeah. that somehow. Yeah, yeah. He's talking about this whole teaching of all these doctrines mm -hmm. of the church as the mystical mm -hmm. tradition. What it really means is the experiential tradition, the experience of presence of the Lord, the experience of active transformation. So there's other words that I would keeps prefer. keeps going deeper and deeper and yeah, deeper. Yeah, that basically whole, that yeah. there's, there's more. Yeah. and that you can actually have contact with God, and God actually wants to work in your soul. And Catholicism isn't just a matter of doing external practices or showing up or obeying the rules, but it's about an ever-deepening personal relationship. So the, the language of personal relationship, the language of growing in union with the Lord, uh, I, I prefer. Even words like mystical or contemplative make you feel like, ooh, I don't know, that's kind of yeah. for a few special people. But one of the things that Pope John Paul II says is that one of the major things the Holy Spirit's really emphasizing today is the universal call of holiness, that, that this had kind of fallen a little bit by the wayside, you know, after, after the early, early centuries. And people like Francis de Sales kind of began to wrote, write the first book for Catholic lay people of spirituality, not until the 17th century, you know, or so. And so this is like a major thing the Holy Spirit wants for the church today. That's why it's so good that we can talk about this. The, uh, some, let's say a guy's made a decision to come out of a pattern, habit patterns of life and just turn toward God and mm -hmm. to follow this call. And he's making progress and he's working hard. And then bam, he falls, you know, and yeah. falls into mortal sin. It happens. Yep. Yep. And so, okay, I get, I'm going to go to confession and I'm going to get back on track again. But then it happens again down the road a little bit. And guys, people come to the point and say, you know what? I'm never going to change. I, this is just too hard. It's too frustrating. And somehow something's wrong with me. Uh, and they give up. I mean, some people plateau, as you were yep. saying, and that's a different issue. Yep. But some people just want to give up because yep. they feel like, is this ever going to happen for me? Yeah. Well, all, all I would say is that it's absolutely a deception of the evil one to give up. So St. Saint, Saint Ignatius of Loyola says, discouragement is from the devil. When, when you feel discouraged, resist discouragement and renew your faith and hope in Jesus Christ. Also, ask, ask the advice of a wise confessor about why is this still happening to me? There may be some basic things yeah. that, that you're not doing or that you're doing that's leading to repeated falls, but sometimes the Lord permits the weakness to persist to, to deepen humility in us and deeper, to, to cure us of pride and, and spiritual pride. And, and so the, the mystery of timing when we get completely free from mortal sin uh, is, is there also, but never be discouraged, never give up because you can't, don't get discouraged about your salvation. The Lord is calling you and he will do it. And, and we get frustrated with the timing sometimes, but uh, he will do it. Yeah, and I think the, one of the reasons, guys, people get discouraged is you think the Lord's not pleased and you come under condemnation, yeah. which the devil loves to do. He loves to trip you up and you fall right. and then condemnation comes. You have to remember there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. St. Peter said to the Lord, how many times must I forgive a man or make yeah. a man be forgiven? 70 yeah. times, seven times a day. The Lord's yeah. mercy is great. Right. And as long as we keep coming back to him and right. turning our heart to him and trusting him, yeah. it'll help. One of the major principles of the spiritual life is just keep showing up. Yeah. Just keep reporting for duty. Just keep facing in God's direction. Just keep praying, yeah. no matter how distracted, no matter how difficult. Persevering. Yeah. And that's a grace, too, that the Lord does want to give us. Peter, you know, time has really flown by, and I can't believe we're nearly at the end of the program. We wow. need to tell people how to get this new booklet called The Final Confrontation. And after we tell you how to get this booklet, which will be a help to you in, in the challenge that we're facing right now, I'd like to come back and maybe you and I could say some final words to folks. Let's do it. Okay. Shortly before John Paul II was elected Pope, he gave this prophetic warning while on a visit to the United States. We are now facing the final confrontation between the church and the anti-church, between the gospel and the anti-gospel, between Christ and the anti-Christ. This prophetic warning was repeated recently by the papal nuncio to the United States as he spoke to all the American bishops. And whether this is the final confrontation or not, we're certainly living in the midst of a tremendous confrontation. In this booklet, I consider what we can learn from scripture about this confrontation and how we can live during it and emerge victorious. To receive your free copy, visit our website at renewalministries.net or call 1-800-282-4789. I think you'll find the booklet I've written very helpful. 
Hey, um, Peter, we, we hardly scratched the surface. We were on, like Teresa of Avila talks about seven stages, and we were only on stages one and two, but I'm really happy that I can refer people to the book for, for lots of tremendous wisdom. It's called The Fulfillment of All Desire. I know it's available through the EWTN Religious Bookstore. It's available on the Renewal Ministries website and lots of other places as well. Peter, um, what, what's on your heart right now? Well, one of the things is maybe we should do a show at some point on the later stages. Yeah. You know, dialing in on what those later stages yeah. are. Yeah, and, and things like dark nights and things yeah, like that. Right, yeah, right, right, dark nights of the soul and all yeah. the rest of that kind yeah. of thing. But um, so if someone wants to get serious, what are the elements of what, what should they avail themselves to to really help that process along right from the get-go? It's surrender your heart to Christ, really say, Lord, I want to go in. So it's a decision of the heart, decision of the will, repentance that needs to take place should happen daily reading of the, of the Word of God. You said a prayer time is crucial every day. Uh, reception of the sacraments, frequent reception of the sacraments, the sacrament of confession. Um, you know, I think something that's helped us a lot is friendship in Christ, I, is I gathering, totally gathering with other yeah. people. You know, find others who are, who are also running after the Lord, who really want to live wholeheartedly for mm -hmm. Him, and begin to open your life and share your life together. It helps yeah. a great deal. Yeah. You know? No, I, I think one of the most important decisions in my own life it was after the Curcio movement, they encouraged you to get involved in a small group where you meet and you talk about how you're doing with prayer, how you're doing with scripture, how you're doing reaching out to other people because even though we're all Christians under construction, it's really great to be under construction, you know? Yeah, It'd be really right. great to invite other people to get under construction too. And, yeah. and so reaching out to others is really good. But I've, I've been in a men's group for like, what, 40 years or whatever, you know, type of thing. And the composition has changed from time to time. But the friendship in Christ that it gets expressed there is really important. The, the lone Christian, the isolated Christian can get picked off. And when they get discouraged, there's nobody there to kind of encourage them or pick them up. And so that, that's really a very practical thing that people can do. And, it, and it's important to be able to get perspective because when we're, we're going through hard times, we're struggling, we fail, um, our perspective can get really skewed because the enemy right. can be there and just start condemning us, as we were right. saying earlier, but also just get way out of balance. And, right. and you need the perspective of brothers. Hey, hey remember all the good things you. that the Lord's done right. in your life. Don't right. forget those things, you know. Right. You've had hard times before. You'll get through it. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. you can end up feeling, there's no hope for me. I'm not going to be able to get through this. Yeah. You need, brother, yeah. the threefold cord is not easily broken, the scriptures said, right. you know. Right. So really to true. come together yeah. is really important. Yeah, let's say a little prayer. Lord, I thank you so much that you've created us for holiness. And because you've created for us for holiness, I know, Lord, that you will give us the grace to do it. And we thank you for this time today to talk about your wisdom, your, your gift to us of this, the wisdom of the saints. And I ask you to just touch everybody's heart who's watching today, who's listening today, and give them a renewed desire to be one with you, or a renewed desire to, to keep showing up and never give up. Mm -hmm.